you open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 6, the first three verses, I'm taking the subject matter for my message today from Hebrews 6, the first three verses. Amen. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, the King James today reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Now I'm going to have us, you'll notice on the overhead, I also offer that same passage today in the NIV, and I'd like to read it as well from the NIV. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. I've titled my message this hour, Forward, and this we will do if God permit. Hallelujah. We're going to move forward today. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master King Jesus, lover of men's souls, we love you, Lord, so much today. We are so grateful for the born-in experience. We're so grateful, God, today that you've allowed us to possess the faith that is able to latch hold of the message of the gospel that we might be saved. We understand, O oh God, today that it is by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, not of our actions, our deeds, our abilities to do something we cannot do or be something we cannot be. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The Word of God must go forth, and it cannot go forth, Lord, effectively, powerfully, without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And this Holy Ghost-filled preacher understands more than any the value and the need, the necessity of the anointing. I pray, Master, right now in the name of Jesus that you would anoint the messenger that you would touch my mind, my feeble lips. Allow me, O oh God, to be today your oracle, your messenger. Lord, that I might not deliver words of man's making, but rather that I might deliver a word from God, a prophetic word from God to the people of God. Let it challenge us. Let it change us. Let it lift us up to higher heights and bring us into deeper depths than you than we've ever before known. We ask it in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. In the King James, it simply says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, in other words, the fundamentals, the basics of Christ. He said, let us go on unto perfection. The problem with the use of the word perfection as we read it in the King James translation of the Bible, most people, they un 
understand the word trans, uh, translated perfection. They understand that word to mean, you know, perfect. Everything is absolutely exactly the way it's supposed to be. But that is not where this word comes from. In the original Greek, the word that is translated in the King James is better translated in the NIV. For that word means to be mature or complete. Doesn't mean you're perfect in the sense that we would understand perfect. But you're mature and you're complete. And in the NIV it said, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Many in the church today have been made to believe that, that the deep things of God, the meat, as it were, of God's Word, is the manufactured mysteries and secrets created by preachers in an attempt to sound deep and to appear to be mining from the Word of God some principle or some precept which is not readily available to the average reader. I want to tell you, I get very concerned when I see a preacher uh, title his mes message, you know, uh, the, the secret to prayer or the secret to answered prayer. Got news for you, honey. It isn't a secret. God isn't keeping that secret from anybody. It is not a mystery that we need some preacher to come along and somehow unveil and unravel this for us so that we can understand it. It, no, that's just your way of trying to make it sound like you're digging deeper than everybody else. And somehow or another, you figured something out that God has been toying with and playing with God's people over. Hello now. In most instances, these mysteries or these secrets, as they're often called, are man-made truths which have nothing to do with biblical truth. The church does not exist today, listen to me children, as a society of mysteries. This was the reputation of the religion of ancient Babylon. In the book of Revelation we read of the revived Babylon as she is described in this way. Revelation 17, 3-5. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. The Babylonian religion was a religion of so-called mysteries. Roman Catholicism, which I believe, according to my studies of God's Word over the past four decades or better, uh, is what is described here in Revelation 17 as the great whore of Babylon. And I'm here to tell you, they still claim Christianity is a religion of mysteries. No, it is not. When people say, I don't get the Trinity, I don't understand the Trinity, the Trinity doesn't make any sense to me, the Roman Catholic Church comes along and tells you, when well, you're not supposed to, it's a mystery. Baloney! That is a lie from the pit of hell. There are no unexplained mysteries in the New Testament church. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 8, the Apostle Paul writes, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, meaning those that are mature, those that are complete. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Paul is saying, we preach what is to the world a mystery. We're not, obviously if I'm preaching the mystery, then I'm preaching the explanation. I'm not preaching the, you know, I'm not giving you a riddle, I'm giving you the explanation. He said, we preach the answer to the riddle, as it were. We preach the answer to the questions that age, ages ago men didn't understand. He said, but God had to wrap it up in something of a mystery. God had to present it in such a way that it wasn't really clearly understood by anyone and everyone that looked at it. He said, because if he hadn't, then they never would have crucified Jesus because they would have known he was the Lord of glory. Hallelujah to God. He was God manifest in the flesh and they never would have laid a hand against him if they'd understood that. So therefore, in times of old, it had to be presented in the form of a mystery. It had to be presented almost in the form of a puzzle or a riddle as it were said because for the Lord to be able to do what he had come to do it was imperative that the unsaved those that had no mind for God or the things of God it was imperative that they not be able to understand it hello now in 1 Timothy 3.16, the Apostle Paul declares, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Meaning, godliness literally means all things that pertain to God. God is the same as the term Godhead. God was manifest in the flesh. He didn't say the Son of God. He said God was manifest in the flesh. Justified, meaning perfect in spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Paul is here expounding what otherwise is a mystery. Do you follow what I'm telling you? said, great is the mystery of godliness. Then he breaks it down. said, God was manifest in the flesh. And he just tells it point for point for point. If God was manifest in the flesh, and all those other things are describing God who has been manifest in the flesh, then, honey, i got news for you. Number one, Jesus is God. And number two, you know it's Jesus because He's the one who literally fulfills every one of the things Paul talks about. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. It's not a mystery. It's not hard to understand once it's explained, once it's revealed. When the Word of God speaks of mysteries... As they relate to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is always speaking of the mystery or the, the hidden truth or difficult to see truth as being now explained or revealed. There are no more mysteries. All mysteries are today understandable as God has made them known to us, has made them available to us through His holy prophets and apostles. In Romans 16, 25 through 27, Paul writes, Now to Him that is of power to establish you, 
according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment and my notes cut off there why is this important to understand today? Because what many call meat in the church today is in reality fiction. It's not the Word of God, nor is it some hidden truth that requires explanation by some preacher or priest. In fact, we can know what is defined as meat and not as milk from the Word of God itself. We can know what meat is compared to milk. We can know what is uh, the explanation of a mystery. You know what I'm saying? Versus just the basics, the foundation of our faith. This is what Paul said in our primary text today. He said, we got to move forward. we got to get past the basics. we got to get past the milk and into the meat. Am I telling the truth today? we got to grow up and mature so that we're no longer dining on milk and formula and instead we're enjoying a nice thick steak. Hallelujah to God. We can now, excuse me, we can know what the deeper truths of God are as defined by His Word. Simply defined, listen, simply the most simple definition I can give you of meat versus milk, of something that brings us forward, moves us forward toward maturity, toward completion. The most simple definition I can give you of the deeper things of God consists, listen, of those things which are difficult to hear. I'll tell you a little secret. A lot of the same things that are difficult to hear are difficult for the preacher to preach. A lot of times, <laughs> I know the Holy Ghost is laying in my spirit. I need to say something about something. I need to say something. But it's I have to really work against my human nature because my human nature says, man, they're going to crucify you if you say that. Man, they're going to come after you if you, do you understand what I'm saying. I remember preaching one time in a church of God. I believe it was right here in Keller, Texas. I had gone there at the invitation of the pastor. I was preaching evangelistically at the time. And I remember uh, preaching in that church and the pastor afterwards said to me, he said, brother, I'll tell you what, he said, I had never seen a preacher preach with the anointing of the Holy Ghost that God puts on you. He said, son, I was only literally about maybe 20, 21 years old at the time. He said, son, the Spirit of God puts an anointing on you, and when you preach, you preach with a prophetic anointing. You preach like a prophet. He said, because the Spirit of God is behind every word you say, and as people are hearing you, they know they're hearing from God. He said, you say things that if I said it, they'd run me out of the church on a rail. <laughs> said, so there are things you say that if I were to preach that, if I were to say those exact same words, man, they'd be voting me out of this church and looking for a new pastor. He said, but when you preach it, the people of God feel it and they know it and they sense that it's right, even though it's hard to hear. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Simply defined, the meat of God's word is that which is hard to to hear. Also meaning that it oftentimes is difficult to say. 
I remember when I was pastoring my very first church. I was 19 years old in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. And I remember I used to kind of get annoyed sometimes. I'd get frustrated sometimes because, man, I'd be preaching something and to me it was shouting music, you know. To me, if I were sitting in the pew and a preacher preached what I was preaching, man, I'd have been jumping up out of my seat, leaping and dancing and shouting all over the church because it was meat. It was good. It was, you know, something really substantive, but exciting at the same time. And I had a bad habit. I used to say all the time, oh, if I just had a church full of Pentecostal people, we'd be shouting and running the aisles and rejoicing at hearing that. And one of my members, he was actually one of my founding members. He was in our very first service. He, his wife, and two kids, Leo. One day we were talking and Leo said to me, he said, you know, Pastor, he said, you talk about if you had a church full of Pentecostal people. He said, you know what the problem is? He said, you're mature enough in the Lord to understand what you're saying like this. As soon as you hear it, you know, you chop down on it and oh, I, oh hallelujah, I'm, I, in spiritual terms, the juice begins to flow out of that meat. You know what I'm talking about? Oh my goodness. And you begin to taste that fat. You begin to taste that juicy steak. And boy, I mean it's good in your mouth. And as a spirit-filled man, you, you want to shout. You want to rejoice over it. He said, most of us we're coming out of churches. We're coming from backgrounds where all we've ever heard is meat, is milk. All we've ever heard preached is milk. He said, what you're saying is brand new to us. What you're saying is something that really requires that we think about it. And we meditate on it for a minute. And we chomp on it a little bit. And we work it a little bit. He said, and boy, once we do, and it gets into our spirit. He said, man, I'm telling you, then it tastes good. He said, oh, it's good. He said, but we just don't have that instant reaction because we're not where you are. And all of a sudden, Tommy, I realized, I thought, you know what? Bless his heart. He's right. The meat is good to me because I can handle meat. But to those who've only eaten milk and formula and maybe they've graduated to cream of wheat or purina you know what I'm talking about that soft food maybe they've had a little bit of jerker but everything has been emaciated and everything has been turned to mush for them so they can swallow it all of a sudden when they're hearing preaching that's challenging when they're hearing preaching that actually makes them think that challenges them to step up higher they just sit there like a bunch of quiet little church mice <laughs> because they got to chew on it a bit. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? To me, what I was saying was worthy of celebration. But as Leo, you know, as he explained it, no, we, we have to chew on that for a while. It was then I realized that I was preaching meat to an audience that had only known milk. Meat eaters can shout when you talk about steak and filet mignon. Hallelujah. But milk eaters don't even know what those things are. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a little secret. There's a reason this church doesn't grow at the same rate as other churches grow. And you can, you can judge me all you want to judge me. I don't care. I know it's the truth. Because this church has never preached milk. We don't preach milk. We preach meat. And the people that are attracted to this church are the few and far between who are interested in the meat of God's Word and not just the milk. Am I telling mm -hmm. the truth? They're willing to hear what's hard to hear. They're willing to hear what challenges us to step up and be better. 
My goodness. Mm -hmm. Because the ultimate goal is perfection, meaning maturity, growth, advancement, moving forward. Hallelujah. That's supposed to be our ultimate goal, to move forward in the Lord, to advance, to grow, to mature. But many people go to church. They don't go to the house of God to grow and to mature and to be better and to do better. They go to church so they can be preached happy. They go to church so they can be told they can be rich. They go to church so they can be told God wants them to drive a rolls or God wants them to live in a mansion. Listen to what Paul said in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Of whom we have many things to say, listen, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, Paul said, as long as you've been in this thing, y'all ought to be at a place where you're teaching. He said, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Do you understand what Paul's saying to these folks? He said, y'all been in this thing a long time. He said, there are things I need to say. There are things going to be hard to hear. He said, I got news for you. They're hard for me to say. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. He said, they're hard for me to say. He said, the only problem is, y'all are in a place where you should be able to teach others, and instead of being at a place where you can teach, you're needing me to go back to the beginning. You're needing me to go back to the basics and cover the milk all over again because you can't handle the meat. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? You're not in a place to move forward. You're not in a place to advance. You're not in a place to mature and grow. You're still infants. You're still babies. Listen to what else he says. For everyone, verse 13, Hebrews 5, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Said baby's got to eat milk. You can't give a baby meat. Hello now. <laughs> it don't matter if they act like they want it or not. They'll choke to death on it. They haven't got the teeth to chew it. Listen, in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul again writes, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto or until now ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men. Paul said, listen, your envious, your strife, your division, that's evidence of the fact that you're still babies. You haven't grown up yet. Hello now. Listen, when a child of God grows, as a child of God matures, they act different. Mm -hmm. Hello now. They act better. Mm -hmm. I got news for you. When I came back to the Lord in 1993 and I started my affirming ministry, there were a number of things that I'd allowed myself to do while I was out of church. And frankly, I still allowed myself to do some things I shouldn't have been doing. But over the course of time, guess what happened, Tommy? See, I'm going to tell you, the first person hears every sermon this preacher preaches is me. 
And if you think that I don't value what comes off of these lips as the word from God, you're wrong. Because I'll listen to my own sermons and they will challenge me. Man, I mean... <laughs> There are, times, there are times I've listened to my own sermons and I've walked away and my own conscience was convicted me. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Because I knew that what I said is something I need to work on. What I said is something I need to perfect and I need to get it in a better place. I got news for you, honey. Where I'm at today, what I'm living today, how I act today, how I behave and conduct myself today is a million miles from where it was in 1993. Because ever since 1993, I have been on a pathway toward perfection. I've been on a pathway toward maturity. I've been on the pathway toward uh, completion. Because the Word of God says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's not that we're going to possess peace with all men. It's not that we're going to possess holiness in our life. The Bible said all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. It's not that we're going to possess it, but we have to be in pursuit of it. Mm -hmm. And if you're in pursuit of it, then you should be moving forward. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday, we should leave the house of God at least two or three steps ahead. Am I telling the truth? Every Sunday, we should leave the house of God having moved forward in our faith, having moved forward in our walk with God. All we may have realized under the preached word of God, under the anointed preached word of God, we may have realized that there are some things in our life we need to work on. There are some things in our life that we really need to ask the Lord to help us with. Am I telling the truth? But we ought to be constantly moving forward. But honey, we got people who've been in church for 40 years and they still can only handle milk. We visited a mainstream apostolic Pentecostal church. Our church did. Several of our folks did. Right here in the Dallas area. And I loved the pastor. He was very supportive of us. And he was very receptive to us. And I appreciated that. Every single time I used to see him, when we, we didn't go there a lot because I'm not foolish. I know to be careful about. I don't want to cause him division in his church. I don't want to cause him strife in his church because he embraces us. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not going to cause trouble in another church, folks. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to walk in wisdom. So when we went to his church a few times over the course of a few years, and uh, but every time he'd give me a hug and he would whisper in my ear, I appreciate the work you're doing. Every time. We would go there and we would watch him preach. And there were times when he would try to share something substantive. You remember? There were times he would try to say something that actually had some meat on it. Something that offered real substance. Something that challenged God's people to step up and to act better and to live better and to be better. Am I telling the truth? And you know what would happen? That church would fall dead silent. You could hear the crickets. And after a minute, bless his heart, I'd watch him. I'm a preacher. I know how it works. I know how, uh, I, you know, it's like many professions. When you do certain things, you know, and you watch somebody doing the job you do, you understand the mechanics of it, you know. Well, I'd watch him, and then all of a sudden I'd watch him switch gears, and he would go right back to preaching milk. He'd go right back to preaching the basics. He'd go right back to preaching something that didn't say a whole lot of nothing, no how. It was just the most basic thing and man his church had come to life and I mean those people be shouting and getting happy and I tell the truth oh I want to tell you folks 
There's a problem with that because God has called that pastor to lead you to lead you forward. God has called that man of God to help you move forward. He's the, he's supposed to be there to help you achieve maturity. He's supposed to be there to help you achieve growth. He's supposed to be there to help you move from sucking on a bottle with milk in it to chewing on a steak. Many believers can shout and dance when the milk's being preached. But when a man of God dares to dig a little deeper and preach those things which actually require thought and effort to understand and digest, suddenly they recoil. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-14 through 14, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because... They are spiritually discerned. In today's church world, believers want to be told that they can be blessed. They can be rich. They can have big houses and fancy cars. How many television preachers do you see preaching the hard stuff? How many television preachers do you see preaching stuff that's hard for them to say? How often do you see a TV preacher stop and say, Oh Lord, help me to say this, Lord. Help me to deliver this, Lord. Because I know a lot of people aren't going to like what I'm about to say. You don't hardly ever see that in no TV preacher. No. Every one of them knows that everything they're preaching, the people are going to love. They're going to eat it up. The Word of God said, In the last days they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Meaning, they're going to support the preachers. The preachers got the biggest audience. The preachers got the most support are those who are preaching what people want to hear. Mm -hmm. No, there's hard stuff. I could go down a list this afternoon a mile long of stuff that's hard to preach. Stuff that's hard to hear for Christians. But I want to use one passage as an example. This is meat. This isn't milk. This is something when you preach on it, honey. Oh, I'm going to tell you, people don't want to hear this. Matthew 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Oh, that ain't easy to hear, is it? And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. How many times have you heard a preacher preach on this recently? And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, or two miles. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. 
Ye have heard that it hath been said, Love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Oh my, honey, that ain't easy to hear, is it? Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Oh my, that's some meat right there. That's some stuff right there. When the preacher's preaching on this, the saints have to sit there and you know, kind of nibble on it for a while. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. If we're saved and if we got the Holy Ghost and if our heart is right with God, we're asking the Lord as we're hearing this, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. This isn't something that's easy for me to do, Lord. You need to have my tell the truth. He said, Do all these things that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust for if ye love them which love you what reward have ye do not even the publicans the same and if ye salute your brethren only what do ye more than others do not even the publicans do uh, so be ye therefore perfect Oh, so if I'm going to get to that place of maturity, if I'm going to get to that place of growth, if I'm going to get to that place of completion, I've got to somehow find a way to embody all these things. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what the Word of God tells But how often do you see T.D. Jakes preaching on this? How often do you see Jimmy Swagger preaching on this? How often do you see... Uh, uh, Franklin Graham preaching on this. How often do you see Pat Robertson preaching on this? How often do you see uh, all these television preachers preaching on this? No. Instead, they're telling people, you're supposed to stand up for righteousness. If you don't want to bake a cake for queers and bless God, don't you bake a cake for queers. Blah, blah. That is not what the Word of God says. But then you're not preaching the meat of God's Word anyway. You're preaching what people want to hear. Paul said you're carnal. Paul said that they're responding to your message because it's carnal. It appeals to their basest, sinful, unregenerate nature. That's why the evangelical community catapulted uh, Donald Trump to the presidency. Because the evangelical movement today is consumed by carnality. It is consumed by carnality. And the majority of the message preached in evangelical churches is not a true biblical message at all. It is carnal preaching to carnal. They're not preaching spiritual things. They're not preaching those things which are hard to understand, that are hard to hear, that are hard to digest. Am I telling the truth? When I tell you in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe well unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So the Lord is saying, you know, while you're more than happy to do certain things, there are more important things that you're ignoring. He said, I'm not saying you shouldn't do the earlier things, but the problem is you should not have let these more important things undone either. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Church, we're supposed to move forward. We're supposed to advance. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to be better, do better, live better, be a better testimony and a better witness today than we were yesterday. Too many believe.
believers don't want to hear that which is difficult to hear, that which challenges us, that which chastises us and calls us to change, grow, and mature as children of God. Oh no, preacher, just preach what God can do for me. I'm not interested in what the Lord might ask of me. We can only move forward in our faith and walk in a deeper walk with the Lord after we have yielded ourselves to the Word of God and learn to eat the meat, the tough stuff. Adults, mature believers, also understand that with spiritual growth, listen to me children, comes advanced blessing. See, there's a lot of Christians, they want you to tell them how God will bless them and how God can bless them and how God can do this for them, how God can heal, how God can deliver, how God can do all these wonderful things, how He can give you things. But you see, those of us who enjoy chomping on a good steak understand that as you grow and as you mature and as you develop and as you move forward in your relationship with the Lord, you become subject to advanced blessings. See, you don't have to tell me how the Lord can bless me and what the Lord can do for me. All i got to do is focus on moving forward and the blessing will come. If my focus is on moving forward, God is going to bless me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, as I get better, as I do better, the blessings are going to come into my life. Mm -hmm. I remember as a teenager, I got my driver's license just about right on my 16th birthday. When my brother Michael turned 16, my parents were not about to let him get his license. That kid, he was a speed demon. He used to goad my father into laying his foot on that gas pedal and, you know, traveling at crazy speeds. Michael was very unsafe, you know, and he, he loved to do things that were dangerous. And so when his time came, when he got to that age, he wasn't mature enough. He was the same age, but he wasn't mature enough. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He wound up having to wait, I think, a whole nother two years before my mother would finally sign so he could get his driver's license. Boy, I'm telling you, to this day, he's mad about that. To this day, he begrudges the fact. You see, he looks at me and says, well, that, that's because mom and dad favored you. Mom favored you. No, didn't have the, anything to do with mom favoring me. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Had to do with the fact that I was mature enough to handle it. Got news for you, children. If we'll focus on what God has called us to focus on, on moving forward in our walk with Him, guess what? The more you mature, the more you grow, the more blessing will come, the more favor He'll show, because that's what comes with maturity. Advanced blessing. But we've got people, all they want to talk about is the blessing. They don't want to talk about anything that's required of them that might allow God to bring them. And we've got people who sit there and begrudge God and get angry with God that the Lord doesn't do things for them like He does for those over there. I remember, honestly, I, I have to tell you honestly, I remember when I was a young person, I used to feel that way sometimes. I look at some of the older saints in the church. I look at some of the other believers in the church. And I say, well, you know, Lord, I don't understand. You bless them, and you do this for them, and you do that for them, but you don't do that for me. Well, honey, I wasn't mature enough. I wasn't grown enough yet. I hadn't learned enough yet. I hadn't gotten off the milk and into the meat yet. So I could move forward enough to be in a place. Guess what? I'm in a very different place today. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, God blesses Tommy and I. He blesses us today in ways that I never was blessed years ago. He does things for us today that I never experienced before. I'm going to tell you why. It's not because all of a sudden I found a secret. No, it's not about secrets. It's about growth. It's about maturity. It's about moving forward. Oh, hallelujah. 
the Word of God tells us we can only move forward in our faith and walk a deeper walk with the Lord as we yield to the Word of God. We've got to learn to eat the meat. Oh my goodness. Blessing comes with spiritual growth. So while some today only want to hear of blessing and favor, they are not being trained and taught the true way to attain these things. Hmm. Because the true way to attain these things is hard to swallow. <laughs> it takes some chewing. you got to grow up and be willing to deal with it. Matthew 6.33 tells us as plainly as God can tell us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Meaning what? And how God defines we do things. Doing things right by God's definition of right. And all these things shall be added unto you. It's no mystery. You don't need some preacher to come along and tell you, oh, the secret to blessing, the secret to favor. There ain't no secret, fool. It says it as plain as you can say it in Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Psalm 37 and verse 4, my final passage for the day. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. People of God today, the basics of our faith are wonderful. The basics of the gospel are wonderful. Preaching the cross is wonderful. Preaching the empty tomb is wonderful. Preaching the ascension is wonderful. Preaching he's coming again is wonderful. Preaching that one day the Hitlers of our world and the Trumps of our world are going to stand before a righteous God and answer in the judgment. That's wonderful. We all enjoy hearing that glorious story told over and over again. I love the old song in the church that says, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. But we've been called to move forward, to advance, to grow. We're not called to sit in one spot and play in the sandbox until Jesus comes. We've been called to come up higher. And this we will do when we change our diet and feast on the meat of God's Word. Only then will our lives and testimonies reflect that we are genuinely moving forward. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?